right, guys. Um, thank you for joining me today. Um, it is always awesome to be with you, and I'm so glad that you are tuning in or that you're watching my videos. Um, today's sermon is called An Irresistible God, a synopsis of the biblical story. Um, let's pray. Father, I thank you for what you're going to do and what you've already done, Father. You are God and we worship you and we adore you and we love you, Lord Jesus. Speak to me, speak through me, Lord God, and hide me behind the cross. Let every heart be touched by your story of your love and your grace. Um, in the name of Jesus, amen. Hi, guys. Um, today's sermon is basically uh, for people who don't know about Christianity and or for people who are just new to the faith to um, to discuss some basic uh, concept of the Christian faith. Um, first of all, I should start by saying I've I've been, I grew up going to church, and my father was a pastor, my two grandfathers were, a pa were pastors, um, so I grew up in a strong background of faith, so, and when I went to high school, um, after high school, I went to a college named Tyndale College, um, Tyndale University College and Seminary to be specific um, for Bible College and I got my Bachelor's of Religious Education um, although I started off getting my English degree but um, through circumstances basically meaning it was taking too long for me to get my Bachelor of English degree because I was only able to take a certain amount of courses at the one time. I was only able to take two courses. So I, in the middle of my <clears throat> English degree career, I decided to um, switch over to, to, to get my bachelor's of religious education. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, that's where my background is. So, I'm not a scholar. I'm not, um, I'm not, I love my word of God. I really do, but I'm not really, um, uh, astute in the word of God. So, when I talk about the Bible, um, it's just from a person who basically loves the Word of God. I went to school, but it's not going to be, uh, some kind of, um, uh, very, very complicated, uh, thing. It's just going to be a simple, uh, overview of what is the Bible, why why we serve God and wh who 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 is God and why do we call him he instead of she or it um, I'm going to try my best to tackle some of these questions like this whole thing is not exhaustive by any means and this is just um, what I uh, my task what God tasked me to do today so let's start with um, who is God well the Bible says that God is a spirit God is neither he nor she but the reason why we um, express him as he is because um, when he came down 
son is Jesus. Um, he came down as a man. And also, when he describes himself in Genesis, he says, um, God breathed into man and made him a living soul. And man was made in the image of God. Um, so, man, um, God created man as an image of himself. So, that is how we know God is a he, because God created man in his own image. And God is always referred to as a him. It's not because God is a gender. It's just because God always refers to himself as a him. So that's why we call him a he and why we know he's not a she or an it. Um... When, when you talk about the biblical story, um, you need to start from Gen Genesis. Um, basically, the story of Genesis is, many of you may know the story of Adam and Eve in the garden and creation. Um, but let me just, um, give you a synopsis of that story, just in case you haven't heard it. Um, we in Christianity believe that the world was created by the Word of God in six days. Now, when we say the Word of God, we don't mean just one word like that. We, we mean that God spoke and anything that he spoke is his word. So when we say, when you hear a preacher say it's in the word of God, it's, you know, the Bible is the word of God, we don't mean one literal word. We mean the, the word of God is, ev is everything that he spoke and everything that he wrote or inspired other people to write, um, which is how the Bible came to be, but I'll get to that later. Um, so w when we say the word of God, we mean everything that he spoke, everything that he, he brought forth is his word. We don't mean uh, a literal word. I got that question from someone, um, someone a few years ago. She's like, you didn't speak a word, you spoke an actual sentence, what does that mean? Well, so that's what it means. Um, second of all, who is, God, who is God, I already said that he's, a, that he's the spirit. I've already said that he has no gender, but the reason why we call him he is because in the biblical text, he always refers to himself as a man. And the Bible always refers to himself as a man, and Jesus came down as a man. Uh, and so... Let's talk about the Bible. The, the Bible is the Christian, I think we would say, holy book. And I believe um, that it, it is the living, breathing word of God. And in the, in the Bible, we, it says the word of the word, the Bible, is is God breathed, which means it was written by people, but people that um, 
heard the voice of God, sometimes literally and sometimes it was an impression. Um, so the Bible is, we, we call it in Christian circles, we say the inerrant word of God, which means we we believe that it had that it has no mistakes, no errors. And basically why a lot of people think there are contradiction contradictions in the Bible is because the Bible was written by several different people over hundreds of years. And you in the Bible, you get all kinds of different uh, writers writing in the same book. So it's like, um, it's like if somebody were to write a journal and write it over, let's say, five years, and different writers write a certain part of it you get different perspectives and different feels and different um, different ways of thinking of, of things. So that's why at times it looks like the Bible is contradictory, contradictory but it's really not. It's really just different perspective, perspectives and sometimes as in Paul, um, it's just for a different purpose. So Paul may bring out a certain, I'm talking about the Apostle Paul, uh, one of the writers, one of the main writers of the New Testament. He may bring out a certain issue and say something uh, different about it in one text say something in one text and something different in another text about the same issue. It's not that it's contradictory, it's just that he's bringing out a different part of that issue at a different time about, this, about the same issue. Uh, okay, so let's get back to the Bible. Uh, so the Bible is made up of 66 books and when I say books I don't mean 66 full chapter books uh, although we do call them chapters I know it's confusing but <laughs> but um, basically when I say books I don't mean a full like great guess Great Gatsby novel. I mean, like, it's 66 sections with different title names. Some title names are names of people, and some title names are names of cities, and some title names are just basic uh, like judges are just basic uh, type titles like um, to to give you to give you um, a perspective Genesis the book of Genesis um, means the beginning so that's the start of the Bible the book of Exodus it talks about um, the children of Israel and that whole how they came to be and how the people uh, came to be and the book of Numbers basically talks about um, the census that was taken of them basically after the Exodus and after the whole Canaan story Leviticus talks about um, the the laws that God um, gave to his children 
um, and Jude Ron and me talks about um, their 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 journey and Mo and Moses's death. Okay, so what I just described to you was the were the books of what we call the Torah, which are the first five books of the Bible, and then after after that we have um, the um, and some books of the Bible are names of people like Joshua and like Ezekiel and like um, Joshua um, and like things like that um, and the, the, there are Bible, Bible books that are the names of places like uh, Colossians it's a place called Colossae uh, Ephesians Ephesus all of, all of those are names of places um, and it's very interesting. The books have so many different names and so many different writers. It's, it's very interesting. So I'm only doing a brief synopsis here. So, um, but when I think about the Bible and the questions that people have are are very widespread but all I know is that the Bible is the Word of God and we we receive it as such and when when we look at the Bible we we think so, there are two basic schools of thought about the Bible. Um, one basic school of thought is, oh, it's just basic instructions for us to live our lives. It's not very specific. Like, um, an acronym for Bible is basic instructions before leaving Earth. So, yeah, that's one school of thought. But my school of thought is the Bible is actually um, a mirror to humanity. So all the characters in the Bible, like Moses and Joshua and Paul and all of that, they, they were human just like us. They had flaws just like we do. They had issues just like we do. They struggled with temptation. They struggled with relationships. They struggled with uh, friendships. They struggled just like we do. The Bible is for me a mirror to humanity. Basically, because it was a different time, it's sometimes hard to see ourselves but if you look deeper, you can see that they struggle with the same issues that we do. Um, and after, okay, so I talked about the 66 books of the Bible and how each section or what we call a book is made up of different chapters. So when they say in church, turn to chapter, uh, say Leviticus chapter 10. So they mean go to the third section titled Leviticus and go and turn to chapter 10. And chapter 10 is usually a page. Very rarely, well, I suppose in some Bibles, it's more than a page. Very rarely is a biblical chapter more than a page. Um, 
because we know in in book chapters it's definitely more than a page. It's like twenty pages. But biblical chapters are uh, one page one page only. Uh, usually. Um, and the reason I called this sermon the irresistible God is is because when you start reading the Bible and when you dip into those 66 sections or books you get to see yourself and when you get to when you get to read the word of God or what God spoke or what God inspired these people to write you can get to see why he's so irresistible why you can't r refuse him because there is some when you get to understand who God really is and why he came to be who he is and when you find a biblical character who you can relate to it is it is like the lights go on it's like you be you begin to see yourself in a way that you've never seen yourself before um i think I think a lot of us um, don't know ourselves because we've never looked at the Bible that way. We've looked at the Bible as a bunch of ancient stories that don't have any re relevance anymore. But if you look deeper, you'll find a character or characters that are going through the same things that you are. And, okay, I meant to talk about the Old and New Testament. So I talked about the books of the Bible. I talked about what the Bible is. I talked about who God is. But let's talk about the Old and New Testament. So along with those 66 books, along with the names of those books, those books are divided into the Old and New Testament. So basically, the Old Testament is before Jesus, and the New Testament is after Jesus. So the Old Testament talks about God and the creation of the world that goes into the creation of his people and goes in the goes into the creation of society where whereas the New Testament goes into uh, Jesus and um, why he was sent and whatever and after Jesus as well and I'll talk about the Christian view of Jesus now. We believe in Christianity that Jesus is the Son of God. And when we say Son of God, we don't mean literal Son. We mean that Jesus came from God. He was brought forth from God to be a human representative of God. So, basically, we believe that Jesus came to earth as God and man to really not just die for our sins, but to, to show the world how to love and how to live and how to treat people. Because at, at the time of Jesus, um, people were in a mess. They were 
it was so so many opinions so many different people were doing so many different things so many religious sectors believe so many different things that it was so confusing and the poor were kind of not really concerned about like not really um love did not really um not really taken care of but jesus came to bring a compassion that the world had never seen before jesus was very radical in his day he came to bring a compassion a love a life that the that the world has never seen before and he also came to die for our sins and what that means was he gave his life um let's go back to the beginning for a second uh when god created the world world and spoke the world into being he because we believe that god spoke his word and things just were um but when god did that he created man to be in his own image and the original intention for man was to um have a being that was like god on the earth but when adam and eve sinned they ate the forbidden fruit from the tree which god told them not to eat and they spun the world into turmoil and time and again humans kept failing in their in their um quest to get back to where god originally wanted um him th- them to be so god sent jesus because he was the only one with up sin and the only one who could get us back to God's original intention by dying and shedding innocent blood and rising again so that's what he did um and so when when we say that Jesus died for our sins we mean that he died and Jesus gave up his life on the cross to die for everything we've done wrong so everything that we will do wrong everything that we have done wrong everything that we will ever do in our lives Jesus died for that and all we have to do is embrace the fact that he died and the fact that his love is is totally for us and he loves us so much and he wants us to know that he loves us he wants us to know that he cares and that we're not alone and he wants us to 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 love each other the way he loved us so after he died he went up to heaven but when he went up to heaven he sent the holy spirit the comforter or what we call in christian circles the paraclete which means uh the comforter basically to be our guide and to uh help us through life. So that's why you often see you often hear Christians say, "Oh, the Holy Spirit told me to do this. The Holy Spirit uh did that or the spirit of God is totally in this place today because we're talking about the holy spirit that jesus left when he went to prepare 
a place for us. Um, when you think about um, reading the Bible, I'm going to get very practical here in a second. Um, I'm going, before I talk about reading the Bible, I'm going to talk about the Gospels. Um, the first books of the New Testament, the first four books of the New Testament are called the Gospels, which are basically written by, remember I said the, the Bible is, the books of the Bible were written by different writers? Well, these writers are, were men who actually walked with Jesus. Could you imagine actually walking with Jesus, actually being there in his ministry, actually seeing blind eyes open, deaf ears healed, and all of that. So these men actually walked with Jesus. So Matthew, Mark, Luke and John were actually his, his disciples, which were basically, which are basically 12 men who walked with him uh, for three years. They, they actually, they were kind of like interns. They walked with him for three years, saw how he taught, saw how he healed saw what he did to learn from him. So when Jesus went up, they could continue as his disciples spreading the truth of who Jesus was and his love and how um, he worked. So, so saying that we are now called to, to spread the word of God um, as his disciples. So he said, he said, he said, I used to call you my disciples, but now I call you friends. So now he, he moved from calling us disciples and creating disciples to calling us friends. And it is just amazing to think about. Um, and what, why I call this the irresistible God, and I'm talking about the Bible and the scriptures and uh, what happened, is because when you read the Bible, when you really get down into the words that God inspired through his com the Comforter, through the Holy Spirit, you get to understand how irresistible, irreplaceable God really is. And when you understand that, when you have a per and when we talk about in Christianity having a personal, we say God is not a religion, it's a relationship. We mean that God is not a simply yes or no, do this, don't do that, and you'll make it into heaven. It's not simply a series of rules. It is actually a relationship with God. The, the um, root word of relationship is relate. So God wants us to relate to him in a personal way. He doesn't just want to be obeyed. He just doesn't want us to follow rules and, and be, a, be good people and hopefully we'll get into heaven. He wants a relationship with us. He wants to walk with us, talk with us, be with us. He wants to speak to us 
through his spirit. Because remember I said at the beginning, God is a spirit. Um, so he wants us to invite his spirit into our lives so he can be an active part of our lives. Too many people make God just a passive part of their lives. Like they, they pray their little prayer every day and they go to work and they whatever. He wants to be very active in, in your life. He wants to be a part of every decision, big or small. He wants to be a part of everything in your lives. He just wants to be with you every day. He wants his paraclete, his Holy Spirit, to speak through, uh, to you. And to end this today, I, I'm going to say that just invite him in. Just in your own words, say how much you need him. Um, in the book of, I think it's, oh, uh oh, I'm so terrible at this. He said, I don't remember what book it is. He said, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, he, he, he's faithful enough to forgive you of everything you've done wrong, everything you will do wrong. He, he wants to be a part of your life and all you have to do is believe in your heart and confess in your mouth that he is Lord and you will be saved. And what we mean by saved is basically he will come into your life and restore everything broken. Everything that is broken in your life right now, he can restore it. Everything that is, that is lacking in your life right now, he will restore it. And I'm not going to tell you that it will be easy because it, it won't. It may take work. It may take struggle. But at the end of it, you'll be so much better for it. And, he, and he'll know the processes to take you through um, to get you on the right path. And he'll know the people to put you around. So today, if you're watching this and you don't have a personal relationship with God, just believe in your heart. heart just confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. Um, I'll see you later. I'll see you next week, guys. I hope this was helpful. This is not exhausted by any means, but I hope it gave you a bit of a overview of the Bible and what Christianity is all about. Bye. See you later. Oh, One thing I did forget to talk about 
is the blood of Jesus? What is that all about? Why do people always talk about the blood of Jesus? So, as I said before, Jesus was sinless and he had to die for our sins because the world was so terrible that there were no there was no recourse but for somebody sinless to die. But because Jesus is God, his blood, when he shed his blood and because of it was sinless and spotless, we believe in Christianity that the blood of Jesus has redeeming qualities. So, um, we believe that the blood of Jesus is the life of Jesus and whatever wrong you did, whatever issues you have, whatever you're facing, the blood of Jesus can cover it and restore it. And that's why the blood of Jesus is so important. And when you accept him into your heart and into your life, that's what happens. The restorative power of the blood of Jesus comes and takes over your life and restores it and redeems it. And it's almost like you haven't done anything wrong in your life. And I'm not saying that it's going to be easy from that point, but at least you'll have someone to help you through, through whatever you need to go through. His blood can get you out of everything. And I know it sounds gross, but it's true. His blood is so, is so, what we call it efficacious, which means it's so restorative. The power of the blood of Jesus is so powerful that it can make right everything. And I pray that you, if you don't know Jesus today, I pray that you, in your own words, in your own way, ask him to reveal himself to you. Ask him to come into your life. And if you need help with this, I'd be so happy to help you. My email address is... is is lady.rachel24 at gmail.com that's lady.rachel24 at gmail.com and I should say this I should say this I'm not a theologian this video was not to debate any theological issues um this was just to give people uh, an overview of Christianity. People that were wondering, people that were searching, uh, people that were are just curious about what this Christian thing is. This was in no way to be offensive or cause debate. Um, so I will see you next week. week. <laughs> did I say wheat? I did. I meant see you next week. Bye, guys. I hope you... I hope you let the irresistible God work a miracle in your life today. I hope you at least um, will think about letting him in and letting him take over your life.